So there's a lot of talk nowadays about the dangers of postmodernism and the way that it has produced a state of disorientation and a lack of coherent worldview. And um, politically, socially, ecologically, chaos seems to be um, you know, running amok in every quarter of, of, of the planet. And a lot of people, a lot of people are trying to think beyond this so-called postmodern condition. Some of them are reactionaries trying to sort of reestablish uh, an imagined prior order that used to exist before whatever the postmodern neo-Marxists arrived and and dismantled everything that had been achieved. Other people react to the postmodern condition by sort of diving um, heart first into some new age mysticism where everything's connected to everything else. And if only we could all just learn to love one another and dissolve our egos, everything would just naturally unfold wonderfully. Um, and, you know, both of these, I think the reaction and the uh, bypass you know, the, the sort of conservative reaction or the uh, spiritual bypass, these are mm, symptoms of the postmodern condition that don't actually, they, they, they think that they're escaping it, but they're actually just symptoms of it. So some of, of what I've tried to think through over the last few years amidst all of this chaos, um, you know, sort of writ large on the political scene, right now as I as I speak um, my thinking has been geared towards articulating really a non-modern form of philosophy which isn't postmodern and isn't pre-modern but is or uh, modern but but non-modern an alternative worldview that of course integrates the important emancipatory and scientific ideals of the so-called modern world and even integrates some of the important critiques of the modern world that, that come out of um, you know, post-structural thought. Uh, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, uh, Gilles Deleuze. Um, you know, when, we, when we take in the work of the critique of modernity, we recognize that modernity itself was, um, had some internal inconsistencies that prevent it from achieving its own ends, really, and that there's a need for a total rethink. And also, I would want to articulate a philosophical point of view, a, a worldview or a meta-narrative, ultimately, a grand narrative that is inclusive of certain ancient or traditional um, truths and, and understandings and practices. I don't think that, you know, as someone like Steven Pinker say, or Daniel Dennett, or even uh, Sam Harris, these, these rationalists who have a triumphal, a triumphalist view of history, where the modern world and, and modern science and reason vanquished the superstitious um, religious beliefs of, of a pre-modern irrational humanity. I think that actually human beings are religious animals. We are spiritual creatures and we cannot do without myth as rational as we may think we are at an emotional level we are uh, at an imaginal level um, we are driven by narratives that are mm, often unconscious and we play out these narratives unconsciously even while we think we are rationally deciding to design our lives in this or that way and if we pretend, like someone like Dennett would, that we could somehow cure religion, that religion is just some sort of mind disease that has succeeded in getting itself copied uh, through generations of human societies. Uh, if we start to pretend that that's the case, I really think we run the, the risk of destroying ourselves. So we can't, in our politics, do without some sense of the divine. 
So, uh, you know, another way of talking about this postmodern condition that we're in is to describe it as, as late modernity or late capitalism, right? And to sort of better grasp its metaphysical underpinnings, it might be best to start by comparing it with um, early modernity. Early modernity was dualistic on one side of the ontological divide where rational subjects who, f who by freely entering into a social contract became citizens in a democratic state. Now, on the other hand, uh, on the other side, were mechanical objects, which by obeying universal causal laws operated as part of a deterministic nature. Right? So free rational subjects on one side and deterministic nature with its universal laws on the other. Human society, non-human nature. Modernity thus began with a twin mission, what Bruno Latour refers to as the double task of, emancip of emancipation and domination. The emancipatory task of modernity is political to end exploitation of humans by other humans. The task of domination is techno-scientific, to become masters and owners of nature. So what happened? Why did late modernity become monistic, as the process theologian John Cobb describes it? For one thing, the 19th century brought the discoveries of geological deep time and evolutionary theory, both of which placed the human nature dualism of the 17th century on far shakier ground. A metaphysical decision was made at this point to reduce human beings to one side of the former ontological dualism. And so we human beings have increasingly been understood as only a more sophisticated form of biological machine. The alternative way of establishing a human nature continuity would have been to reimagine nature as, like us, in some sense, ensouled, animate. Even more important in the collapse of dualism into, of, of early modern, the early modern world's dualism into the late modern world monism, uh, however, was the 20th century failure of communism. What many would consider to be our greatest hope of ending exploitation of humans by humans was outlasted, bested by capitalism, which has since given up on modernity's emancipatory mission and doubled down on domination. The failure of communism, neoliberal capitalists say, showed once and for all that human beings, that human nature is basically selfish Capitalists argue that domination and mastery of both human labor and natural resources through a kind of market monism is our only hope for an albeit quasi-civilized existence. Only the invisible hand of the market can assure the stability of civilization. Everything from politics to religion to education to healthcare should be given over to the free market as though no other form of self-organization could help order our societies. As the Jamesian political scientist, that's William James, um, Kenan Ferguson describes it in his book Politics in the Pluriverse, late modernity brought a, quote, shift in political science toward representing political actors as economic consumers. The increasing economism of political science has meant that many of the issues of interest to political philosophers, sovereignty, legitimacy, representation, have been recast as potential choices in a marketplace of ideologies where voter consumers are peddled competing brand names." End quote. What's clear is that the 20th century only led modernity to replace one war with another war, the Cold War, for the Warming War. Capitalism no longer faces another human enemy. It is now at war with Gaia, as Latour says, and I quote, by seeking to orient man's exploitation of man 
toward an exploitation of nature by man, capitalism has magnified both beyond measure, end quote. Our situation as late modern people is stated starkly by Latour. He says, between modernizing and ecologizing, we have to choose. Ecologizing our civilization will require reimagining the philosophical assumptions underlying the modern worldview. In Whitehead's words, I quote, a philosophic outlook is the very foundation of thought and of life. As we think, we live. I think I speak for most of you uh, listening right now when I say that Ideas matter. Philosophy is not merely mental entertainment. On the contrary, it is a matter of life and death. As Whitehead argues, the dominant philosophy of every age molds our type of civilization. Modern philosophy, largely shaped by Descartes' understanding of the relationship, or lack thereof, between the free human spirit and an entirely mechanical nature, has been thoroughly critiqued by contemporary environmental philosophers because of its ecologically disastrous side effects. Most serious, uh, most serious thinkers no longer consider dualism to be a living option, as William James might say. Descartes' early modern dualism split spirit from matter so thoroughly that it left no room for life. Late modern market monism by reducing Earth to, at best, a resource, and at worst, a trash bin, and by reducing human beings to cogs in a techno-capitalist profit machine, neoliberal capitalism, or market monism, has, has gone even further. Since it not only leaves no room for life, it actively seeks to exterminate it. The currently unfolding mass extinction is not at all surprising as the outcome of modern philosophy. 500 years of modern philosophy. To Whitehead's statement, we must add the corollary statement. As we think, or fail to think, we die. Both dualism and monism have failed us. At this point, as Latour puts it, I quote, we have to fight trouble with trouble, counter a metaphysical machine with a bigger metaphysical machine. I'm following Whitehead, James, Latour, and Isabel Stengers in proposing an alternative, more ecological metaphysical scheme. I call it ontological pluralism. And it's pretty easy to define, uh, but it's not quite as easy to understand. It is the metaphysical position which suggests that there are more than one, or two, or three, or any finite number of ways of being. Reality is the ongoing composition of a multiplicity of more or less overlapping modes of existence. We are so used to thinking of reality as something unified, a finished one, capital O, that the possibility of its becoming many may at first seem like a terrifying prospect. To the extent that modern inheritors of the liberal tradition really understand its implications, it should be terrifying, since it dissolves all our hubristic certainties about ourselves and about the world, about who and where we think we are. Part of the rationale behind the modern bifurcation of nature is that defining nature or matter as inert, dead stuff enabled us to establish our own identity as free agents to challenge the inertness of nature, to recognize its agency, is also to challenge liberal notions of individual human freedom. Challenging these notions does not mean dismissing them. We are agents too. But it does mean reimagining the very foundations of individual identity and social contract-based politics. There are less radical forms of pluralism, like cultural relativism, uh, multiculturalism, worldview pluralism, and so on, 
Everybody knows, though, that there are other ways of knowing, other cultural practices with their own psychological and even perceptual ways of representing reality. Um, moderns accept that there are multiple views of the world. But what nobody living in the modern world doubts is that one world underlies all the views that humans can have of it. Many views, one world. Many cultures, one nature. Ontological pluralism, in contrast, is not multiculturalism. It's multinaturalism. Multiculturalism, as Latour points out, is only the flip side of modernity's mononaturalism. Modern Western people have, for a few hundred years, thought of themselves as only a half culture, since unlike all earthly, all other earthly peoples, they were also the practitioners, those modern people, of something called capital S science, the faithful servants of something called capital R reason. Their science and their reason, so the story goes, granted them, modern people, access to an objective and universal nature, an external world out there that for so much of human history had remained buried beneath cultural projections and superstitions. Moderns sent their anthropologists to study exotic peoples in faraway lands, always assuming that no matter how different those people appeared at first glance, beneath the surface, the same universal laws belonging to the same physical nature must be governing their behaviors. Yes, we Westerners also have our subjective quirks, our psychological complexes and superstitions, but still, only we had the good fortune to have discovered a way to uncover nature, to put aside our cultural, our cultural idiosyncrasies so as to reach naked and indisputable matters of fact. It then became our sacred duty to educate others about the one true world. Prior to modern European science, medieval European religion had attempted something similar. There was one God, one final divine arbiter who decided what was good and true for everyone. For modern scientific people, the one major difference is that the one nature is understood to be entirely disenchanted and meaningless. Latour describes the paradox, and I quote at length, Modernization compelled one to mourn the passing of all one's colorful pretensions, one's motley cosmologies, of all the many ways of life with their rich rituals. Let us wipe away our tears, the, modern, the modernists like to declare. Let us become adults at last. Humanity is leaving behind its myth-imbued childhood and is stepping into the harsh reality of science, technology, and the market. It's a pity, but that's the way it is. You can either choose to cling to your diverse cultures and conflicts will not cease, or alternatively, you can accept unity and the sharing of a common world, and then, naturally, in every sense of the, world, of the word, this world will be devoid of meaning. Too bad, love it or leave it. One may wonder whether one of the many metaphysical origin, origins of the 20th century, world wars, did not consist of this odd way with which the West sought to pacify all conflicts by appealing to a single common world. How long can one survive in peace when torn by this impossible double bind with which modernizers have trapped themselves together with those they have modernized? Nature known by reason unifies, but this unification is devoid of meaning." End quote. Whitehead's self-entitled philosophy of organism provides us with an example of a fully ecologized philosophy Multinaturalism means neither science nor the universe it purports to study are ready-made, unified wholes. There are as many sciences as there are natures. From a pluralist perspective, if wholeness is to exist, it must first be constructed and thereafter constantly maintained. Unity does not exist in advance of such composition. If any science qualifies as the science of holes, and in a pluralist ontology there are, there are many holes and not just one hole, if any science qualifies though as the science of holes, it is ecology 
which traditionally has been defined as the study of the relationship between organisms and their environments. But in Whitehead's scheme, the concept of an environment cannot just be taken for granted as fixed, as some sort of inorganic background. The environment is not, as Latour put it in his Gifford lectures on Gaia, a mere frame devoid of any agency. There is no environment. There are only ever communities of other organisms. In an ontology of organism, physics and chemistry are no longer considered to be descriptions of the meaningless motion of molecules, to which biology is ultimately reducible, but rather themselves become studies of living organization at ecological scales other than the biological. In other words, ecology replaces physics as the foundational science. An ontology of organism opens us to the possibility of a cosmopolitics, a concept originally developed by Isabel Stengers. Cosmopolitics has been articulated as a protest against what Whitehead calls the bifurcation of nature, the splitting off of human consciousness and values from everything physical and factual. We are left by this all too modern predicament Whitehead tells us, having to somehow reconcile the dream of our common sense experience of an apparently meaningful world, to reconcile that with the scientific conjecture of a mind independent and meaningless reality. Ontological pluralism, unlike modern dualistic and materialistic metaphysical schemes, rejects the division of appearance versus reality, experience versus nature, and instead suggests a pan-psychic vision of things. As Whitehead put it, everything perceived is in nature. And I would add, everything in nature perceives. There is no bifurcation. To speak crudely, mind belongs to nature, is intrinsic to it. Whitehead said in his magnum opus, Process and Reality, I quote, we find ourselves in a buzzing world amid a democracy of fellow creatures." End quote. Whitehead here alludes to perhaps his most significant philosophical influence, William James, who famously referred to the experience of pre-egoic infants as a great, blooming, buzzing confusion. In his book, A Pluralistic Universe, one of the last significant lectures that James delivered before his death, he suggested that, I quote, the common socius of us all is the great universe whose children we are. Cosmopolitics calls upon us to recognize that the polis, the city, is not just built by and for us on a planet passive before our projects. We must wake up from the nightmare of bifurcation to our roles as creaturely citizens of an earth community. If modernity has culminated in the bifurcation of mononaturalist science and multiculturalist politics, then the emergence of a non-modern, ecological, and so ontologically pluralistic civilization will require the, re the reinvention of both, of both science and politics. Not only must ecology replace physics as the at the foundation uh, of the natural sciences, it must replace economics at the foundations of the social sciences as well. Cosmopolitics is an attempt to do just that, to reimagine scientific practices in more democratic terms, and to reimagine politics in a way that acknowledges the need to invent ways of coexisting, not just with other people of our own color or country or culture, not even with other human beings, uh, just other human beings, but with all Earth's creatures. To democratize science doesn't mean facts should be determined by popular opinion. Rather, it means recognizing that scientific activity is always undertaken upon a landscape shaped by socioeconomic interests and fraught with political implications. Knowledge is an ecological affair. It's an ongoing, risky process of building alliances and relationships between humans and non-humans across, across wide distances. Knowledge is not, despite modern epistemic pretenses, the product of an objectifying gaze from nowhere. Stengers points out the tendency 
many modern scientists and technologists have, to, quote, defer to something called politics or to political decisions that would have to be made about the use of data and techniques produced in new labs. That use will be whatever, quote, we decide it should be, but this, quote, we, purely human and apparently decisional, will intervene in a situation that will already be saturated with decisions made in the name of technique, of, of science, and of rationality. Politicians will demand that experts tell them who, quote, we are from the scientific point of view, end quote. Whereas early modern dualism and late modern monism alike produced expert scientists who claim to have unmasked with objective certainty, a truth hidden from common sense experience. Pluralism is an intrinsically diplomatic ontology. The pluralist responds to encounters with others under the assumption that reality is an ongoing and open-ended geostorical adventure of planetary negotiation, which is to say it is always in the making and never at rest in the possession of an isolated heroic knower. The ontological pluralist doesn't falsely align uh, fetishized ideas of science, rationality, and objectivity on one side and oppose them to belief, custom, and illusion on the other. Instead of, in every case, sending in the experts to tell local populations how to solve their problems, assuming in advance that scientific knowledge is universal and that only science has the right to produce knowledge. Instead, every issue is approached diplomatically under very different assumptions, like that knowledge is relational, like that its claims are conditional, um, and that its construction is risky. Cosmopolitics is not cosmopolitanism, not rooted in the search for some abstract sense of universal humanity. The notion of human rights may have functioned in a liberatory way in some cases, but just as often, uh, argues Isabel Stengers, it has served as a way of disqualifying those whose unique ways of life fail to fit the universal mold. Stengers, Latour, and others are highly critical of this modern attempt to politically unify all peoples through an, through an all-too-abstract notion of humanity. Such an attempt moves too fast, pretending to achieve in advance what can only be accomplished at the end after much negotiation. As Latour puts it, quote, unity has to be the end result of a diplomatic effort. It cannot be its uncontroversial starting point. Stengers links the failed notion of human rights to the, quote, curse of tolerance. The idea that so long as you keep your differences private, we can learn to live together in public. In other words, so long as you don't take your own cosmology seriously and are willing to accept the strange mononaturalist, multiculturalist, double bind of modernity, then we can tolerate one another's abstract right to exist. So long, of course, as you stay over there in your own neighborhood and don't force me to deal with the dissonance of such a strangely bifurcated image of reality too directly, for this all-too-abstract form of peace would quickly dissolve if we concretely encountered one another's differences. If there is to be a future cosmopolitical or ecological civilization, it will no longer accept the dichotomy between public and private life. We will have to find a way to meet the challenge of inventing a means of living together, of coexisting within the same extended community. We will have... Um, we will all have become diplomats, willing to exist in the tension-filled space between worlds, to accept that our own identities are always risked in encounters with others, acknowledging that our own world must be unfinished so long as it leaves others outside it. So what is the take-home of this assemblage of non-modern Whiteheadian philosophical ideas? What is the relationship between Whitehead's metaphysical scheme and the ecologization of our species, of our civilization. How can Whitehead help us transform our cities from gas-guzzling machines into creative contributors to life's flourishing? How are we to convert Whitehead's cosmological theory into a cultural 
and political practice that leads us home again, that allows us to remember that we are earth earthbound creatures inhabiting and traversing a plurality of interrelated places, co-evolving at a multiplicity of speeds. We do not inhabit a unified space-time field determined by universal laws. We are not made of some fantastical stuff called matter, that most abstract, insensible, and confused idea. What I am suggesting is that Whitehead's speculative cosmovision evokes an alternative form of consciousness, provoking a reimagination of modern subjectivity. Whitehead heralds the transformation of the American dream of human individuality and natural property into the dream of the earth, as Thomas Berry, the geologian, called it, or as geostory in Latour's, uh, Bruno Latour's terms. Whitehead's words work upon our souls like alchemical catalysts. His books are, are a psychedelic pharmacopoeia, a remedy for sick minds, he is a philosophical diplomat. He heals the divisions of our intellectual histories, not by rushing to unify them into a single system, but by giving each perspective, each contrast, its place in an organic community of interrelated drops of experience, somehow managing to hang together as a whole, not by necessity, not by right, not by divine fiat, but because of the, because of the persuasive allure of beauty freely calling all creatures toward harmony and order, toward cosmos. The natural world, the universe, the cosmos, nature, etc., is not something we can continue to imagine as apart from, other than, the human world, or the polis, society. The cosmos is just as political as we are, just as much a society of agents vying with one another for power, for access to energy, to food, to sex, to status, attention, and to love. 